Bears Etc. Brought to you by Miller Lite with the voices of the Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. A new day is done at the quarterback position for the Chicago Bears after general manager Ryan Poles deals starting quarterback Justin Fields to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Wednesday, Poles and head coach Matt Eberflus and an entourage from Hallis Hall will be on the campus of USC to watch the Pro Day workout. A potential number one overall pick, quarterback Caleb Williams. We discuss here on episode 60 of the Bears Etc. podcast. My name is Jeff Jonagak with my broadcast partner, the Super Bowl winning Bears guard, Tom Thayer. And coming up, my sit down with the newest Bears wide receiver, former Chargers great Keenan Allen, acquired in a trade last week. Tom, how you feeling? Feeling good, Jeff. You know, still kind of winding down from the Justin Fields trade and um, the contingency that's going out to USC to, you know, observe Caleb Williams. And then I think that he'll come back into the building at Hallis Hall to get his medical check. And um, I don't know if it's a foregone conclusion that it's an obvious, but it's it's pretty close to an obvious um, since uh, Andrew Luck has come aboard. When they get back to Hallis Hall and, and that uh, top 30 visit, that's when they're going to learn a heck of a lot more about Caleb Williams because we've heard Ryan Poles say many times, got to get to know the man. And the best way to get to the man is look him in the eye and talk to him and work with him and see where see where he's at. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of underground investigative work they've already done about uh, – his work habits, his work ethic, his personal life, the type of character he has. And that's from an outside source coming into you. But then you get an opportunity to get, like Ryan says, that eyes on approach. And you get to ask him a question and you get to watch him answer the question. And I think you can learn a lot about a person if you do have that eye-to-eye, face-to-face, room-to-room contact. This episode of Bears Etc. brought to you by Miller Lite. Tastes like Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. All right, so uh, additions. uh, Helping pave the way for a smoother transition for a starting rookie quarterback. Obviously, the, uh, the pro bowler, DJ Moore, with a fantastic season last year with the Bears. Uh, You've got uh, the addition of DeAndre Swift to a backfield that includes Khalil Herbert, Roshan Johnson, and blasting game at fullback. You've got now the addition of Keenan Allen, a big-name receiver, put up incredible numbers over the course of a 12-year career there in L.A. with the Chargers as a former third-round pick, uh, and Cole Komet. And uh, you've got Everett coming in at the uh, other tight end spot, a similar player uh, with uh, some experience. So, and an offensive line that it may or may not be complete. We don't know that just yet, uh, but with promise. So a lot going in the right direction for the Bears offense, Tommy. Yeah, you know, you just brought up a, a bunch of uh, names from the receiver position and how they can complement the quarterback. But, you know, the key to success moving forward is still going to have your running game as your biggest offensive asset. And I think what Chris Morgan, the offensive line, and the offense has been able to do the last couple of years at the running game running game will be the one aspect that benefits a young quarterback the most but then you take that to stage two if you have a super effective running game that it's able to accomplish what it has the last couple years and now you incorporate play action passing into the tight end position the wide receiver position and the running back position you um, have a really dangerous offensive opportunity on unobvious first and second down. Yeah, third and long, you kind of know what your plan of attack is. But if you can have a running game to come in here and be an assistance to all those positions and the quarterback position most of all, you got to set your sights high for this offense going into this year. So some of the mock drafts, I'm not going to go through many of them, but they've been updated ever since uh, the free agency period has kind of wound down in terms of the big names. So Mel Kuyper uh, sticking, of course, with uh, the top pick at Caleb Williams at number nine. He's got the Bears going defense with defensive end Jared Verse out of Florida State. Of course, the Bears only had 30 sacks last season. That elevated when Montez Sweat got there, but still 31st in the league. He's 6'4", 254, and a, a very, very good athlete, very good off the edge. Uh, that's his view of things. And then Daniel Jeremiah continues to pair Williams with a wide receiver, Roma Dunze from Washington. So uh, it depends on how these all fall, how many quarterbacks sneak into the top 10, where the Bears, if in fact they stay at number 9, where will they go? Some people say it'll be a tackle. Some say the top defensive player, whomever they believe that is, and some say a wide receiver. 
Okay, so you have to look at this. What do the Bears need the most? And to me, I think the Bears need sacks and pressure on the opponent's quarterback. And so four or five days ago, I asked you to send me a list of some of the rookies that came in and immediately contribute double-digit sacks. And there was about six or seven of those guys that went on to have incredible careers. Um, and then you think about the receivers since – since since we've been broadcasting in the last 30 years, and you look at the receivers that have come in and have super impactful rookie seasons, and there's not as many of those, Jeff. So if you think of what do you need most to help this football team, you got Keenan Allen, you got DJ Moore, you got a couple of other guys waiting in the wings to be included in that receiver package. You got DeAndre Swift in the running back position, and you got two tight ends right now. So if, if I was out the outside looking in and said, what does this team need most? This team needs 50 sacks. And I don't think that's unattainable, but you're going to need another player to come in there and work alongside or work opposite sides of Montez Sweat. Or, you know, from the inside, too. I mean, you see what these defensive yeah. tackles are doing. They're getting paid. Guards are getting paid, Tom. You missed your window. You missed your big window because the guards, they are investing because it's the closest path to the quarterback from the interior, and these defensive tackles are becoming unbelievable athletes. We just lose one of the best of all time, and Aaron Donald, three-time defensive player of the year, what he kind of dictated in terms of doubles and how to beat it and how it sprung everybody else free to win a Super Bowl for the L.A. Rams, so... Very, very valuable right now. And, and to your point about rookies and sacks, that list that I sent you, Javon Curse back in 1999 is the all-time leader for rookie sacks at 14 and a half. Uh, Alden Smith at 2011 with the 49ers had a star-crossed career because of all sorts of reasons off the field and injury, 14 sacks. Micah Parsons as recent as three years ago with Dallas with 13. Dwight Freeney. Uh, that rookie with 13 for the Colts in 2002, and uh, your old nemesis in 1985, Reggie White with 13 with Philadelphia. And then you go down Simeon Rice in 96 with Arizona, Leslie O'Neill, San Diego in 1986 with 12 and a half, Bradley Chubb in 2018 with Denver with 12 sacks, and our own Mark Anderson, Tom, with Terrell Suggs, Anderson in 06, Suggs in 03, Julius Peppers in 02 each with a dozen sacks. And remember what right. happened with Mark Anderson here. That was a Super Bowl season. You know, he, he was not a first-round pick. He was not a first-round pick, and he comes in and gets yourself 12 sacks. But, you, you know, you think about other guys like Bruce Smith and Dwight Franey and stuff. That Bruce Smith came in as a rookie year. <clears throat> he was about 25 pounds overweight and super ineffective. And then he got introduced to the Stairmaster, and then he had – multiple, I mean, I think maybe 10 seasons with 10 sacks or more. So I'm not saying that it's only going to happen. It can happen on their rookie year. But if I'm looking at a position that the Bears need the most in order to get where they ultimately want to be, when you look at the quarterback position within the division, they need help at pass rushing. By the way, Mark Anderson was picked 159 in round five. <laughs> They Listen, come you know, from everywhere, Tommy. It's 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 unpredictable from Mark Anderson to Brock Purdy. There is no guarantee wherever you're picked, you're going to be a success or a failure. We're brought to you by PNC, official bank of the Bears. We appreciate their sponsorship uh, for a very long time here with the Chicago Bears. Okay, uh, Keenan Allen, let's dig in. Acquired for a fourth-round pick. Uh, reportedly turned out a pay cut from the Chargers uh, earlier on the day. Uh, on March 14th, uh, just last week when the Bears acquired him, rejoining his ex-Charger receiver coach, uh, Chris Beatty, who also has uh, landed with the Bears now. And it's the third wide receiver Poles is traded for, following DJ Moore, Chase Claypool, of course. Uh, right now, one year left on the final year of his deal. Uh, roster bonus already kicked in of $5 million on that contract he signed with the Chargers in 2020. A six-time Pro Bowler offers fifth. 100-yard receiving season in the last seven years, and arguably his best season as a Charger, playing just 13 games. We'll dig in more and get Tom's thoughts. Here's my interview with Keenan Allen. Well, welcome to Chicago, Keenan. Uh, first thing I got to do is congratulate you on what you've already accomplished in your great career. I think that should be said right out of the gate because as a third-round pick who believed in himself, I'm sure, 
uh, coming out of Cal and the uncertainty of, of what your career might look like, what you've done is amazing. So congratulations on that. And have you ever taken a step back and looked back at what you've already accomplished? Not really. Um, like I say, man, I just try to live in the moment and um, just make sure that I'm bringing to the table what I'm supposed to. Try to stay consistent. And that consistency, that, that component of doing that takes a lot. It's just not showing up for work every day. What What is your grind like? Uh, and I, having Mercedes Lewis on the team last year and his uh, crazy workout schedule, and he stuck to it, and it was that consistency. What's yours? It's a process, man. Uh, mine isn't too crazy. It's just about staying in shape, making sure I'm running, making sure I'm uh, hitting the weights. Um, I love doing uh, like track and field type, type stuff, um, make sure my body can handle you know, all types of movements and doing stadiums and just making sure I'm working. <laughs> you a big tape guy or? Film? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big tape guy. Uh, early in my career, I was more, more of a tape guy, but. Yeah. He, he, yeah, you get used to, oh, yeah. Br Brian Erlacher here, you know, he hated watching tape. He yeah. just wanted to get out there and let it, let it rip. So I, I'm thinking that's where you are right now, right? That's kind of where I am right yeah. now, yeah. Um, the moment you heard mm -hmm. that you're getting traded to Chicago, where were you? What went through your mind? And, and give us a, an insight um, into what you were feeling. Sitting down in the game room, playing a video game, uh, got the phone call, you're going to Chicago. Um, excited, you know, excited. Um, you know, my receiver coach came over here. We had just uh, been talking and, um, you know, I was excited about it. New, new organization, um, new city, new fan base. New everything is uh is always fun. You know that's it's got to be a little strange at the same time though <clears> because <throat> you've been a California guy yeah. after Greensboro, North Carolina high school star uh, at Cal, and then the Chargers for all these years. Um, a lot of players when they get parachuted into a new situation, it, it takes them back for a minute. Yeah. Uh, do you think this because your experience and how many years you have been in the league? that it's a little easier transition for you? Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm a little more mature. Um, you know, I'm kind of grown now. I got my own family, uh, wife and kids. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be the toughest part, figuring out that situation, um, you know, how we're going to do the living situation. But, you know, the football aspect is going to be what it is. And, um, you know, I'm going to try to remain the guy I am. I like the girl dad had. I'm a, I'm a father of two girls. Oh, yeah. Much older than yours, I think. But you have, you have four girls? I have three. Oh, three girls. Okay. so. Uh, that's your heart, right? I mean, what, what, what goes on with your family uh, is so important. Um, so how do you break it to your family when you, <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta move? Yeah, just play one more video game and then we'll <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> you know, it was tough. Um, yeah. it was obviously, she, she's from uh, California as well, so it's definitely tough. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know this for certain. Were you ever even close to becoming in your career a free agent? Or were you always extended before that? Yeah, I was always extended with like one year left on the deal. Yeah. So you really never had a situation where you could even explore, and, and, and same with this situation yeah. with the trade. Um, that's a that's a compliment to you, obviously, the value that you have. But um, did it ever leave you wonder what what it'd be like somewhere else? Um, yeah, all the time. Um, you know, you get into those situations where it's not going too good during the season, and you start looking around like, dang, I wonder what they're doing or. I wonder if we're even doing it right. So it's going to be fun. So when you analyze then the fit with the Bears, um, what do you envision? Um, explosiveness. Um, obviously, DJ Moore is already here. Um, you got Cole Komet. Um, just added uh, DeAndre Swift. You know, the quarterback situation is, is it's going to be what it is. Right. And, um, you know, it's going to take it for what it is. I think we got a lot of guys who can uh, make a lot of plays, who can be explosive, and um, you know, just be, be out there on Sunday to be ready to go. Uh, you were blessed to have uh, two big name quarterbacks yeah. that were you know, outstanding players and a Hall of Famer and Phillip Rivers and Justin Herbert on that track. Um, s some other quarterbacks along the way due to injury and whatnot, but did those relationships and how you uh, encountered those and helped advance the careers of both, w will that be <clears throat> something that you can do for the Chicago Bears, whatever direction they go? keep Justin or if they draft somebody and have both guys who knows what yeah. they're going to do yeah absolutely man um something I take pride in you know being being one of the quarterback's best friends um being one of his outlets you know anytime he gets in trouble you know I'm trying to I'm trying to always be there you know you can always you know find me 
now be open. And, um, you know, that's just how I kind of go about it. And, and open in the clutch. I mean, I, your third down numbers are, are Im impressive, yeah. very impressive. I think uh, that's something DJ takes pride in as well. But um, on third down in your career, you had 210 on 261 career third down catches. That's an 80% conversion rate on first down. So uh, what, what's the art of it? Find the green grass. <laughs> it's that simple. Um, I think that was one of the first things I learned, you know, playing football, find the green grass and run to it. And, um, you, know, you know, when usually on third down, it's going to be some type of zone. Um, and when you get man coverage, that's when it's time to really go and um, just try to be open for the quarterback. What have you found over the years uh, as you continually developed and dominated? And maybe, and I'm going to let you answer instead of others writing about it, maybe you had your best year of your career last year. Uh, how defenses and corners or safeties or wherever they try and defend you, how they've adjusted coverage of you over the years? Um, yeah, it gets different every year. Um, every team's kind of different, um, especially those division games. Once you start to play play teams twice, you start to see how they, uh, how they want to play against the team. And, um, you know, that's why it's pivotal to have, you know, everybody out there. Like I said, we have a lot of, a lot of weapons, so it's going to be hard to double just me. You know, you got DJ out there, uh, like I said, and the other names, and, um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be tough to lock in on one person. And, and that's what we had, you know, for, for most of the time with Mike Williams and Austin Eckler and, uh, you know, those guys out there. So, um, you know, it's tough to do that, you know, when you got everybody on the field. Yeah, no offense can be one man. Yeah. No, no chance. And how cool is it too, Chris Beatty was uh, DJ's college coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's cool. So I'm sure you guys know a little bit about each other yeah. and have crossed paths a time or two. Um, what do you think of his game? DJ's? Yes. Uh, man, he's explosive. Um, he's a guy who, once he, when he gets the ball in his hands, he can make a lot of plays. And, um, you know, that's special. That's, that's tough to do. It's a talent. And, um, you know, it's something I try to work on, you know, with my game. In, in terms of what the Bears uh, are, it's a charter franchise in the National Football League. You, you roll in here, the statue of the guy who got it all going, and George Hallis with his fedora out there and a statue, yeah. and just the Hall of Famers in this building, more to come this summer. Um, does that resonate with you in a particular way? And uh, are you a, a deep historian of the game? Absolutely. Um, you know, I grew up watching ESPN all day long, ESPN Classic. Um, always been a fan of the game. And um, obviously, when you get into a building like this, with holds so much tradition. Um, just learned that they got the max numbers uh, ret retired. So that, that's a, a situation all in itself. And, um, you know, it's just special to see, you know, a traditional uh, organization like that. Do you appreciate what the people in San Diego and in L.A., the Charger fan base, felt about you? Oh, absolutely, man. Um, can't say enough about it. Um, I was always embraced with open arms. Um, always loved in the city and um, going to miss it. All right. As an aside, uh, I'm told you are a big fan of uh, hotel pianos. Right? So you can, can you can tickle the ivories a little I bit. I can tickle the well, what, What's the attraction? What's, give me the background. Um, just being in love with the music. Um, I've always been around music, being in, you know, choirs and um, choruses and things like that. And um, one day my friend was playing the piano. We were in like uh, 10th grade going to the 11th. He was playing the piano. He's playing for Elise, Beethoven. And um, I was like, man, that, that's, that's, that's really amazing. <laughs> I need to know how to do that. <laughs> And he just kind of taught me, and I um, just kind of ran with it after that. So, so you're hitting the classics? Yeah. Beethoven? Beethoven. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How hard was that? Oh, it was super hard. You know, to, to play both hands at the same time the first time, it was almost impossible to think about. And then you just got to go with it and just go and make mistakes and make mistakes and figure it out. Is that what you happen to listen to before a game in your headset to get ready? Beethoven? Or? No. No? What do you <laughs> listen to? I'm an R&B guy, man. Um, Big Chris Brown guy, uh, Usher, you know, Tank, Don Tolliver. Have you ever written your own music? Oh, yeah. Okay, nice. And piano is, do you uh, also have any other instrumental excellence? No, I own two guitars, but I can't play them. <laughs> <laughs> try it and try I've again? I've tried, I've tried. And it, you know, I feel like my fingers are too big, but, you know, it's one of those excuses to where it's hard to start over, you know, start from the beginning. I'm already good at something, and then you got to start from the bottom again and try to get good. Put another 10,000 hours in, it's tough to start. Yeah. 
Well, you're at the top coming here, yeah. uh, a future Hall of Famer, and uh, shoot, you got stuff already in the Hall of Fame. We're looking forward to it, and you playing some sweet music here in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. I appreciate it. All right, Tom, number 26 in NFL history and catches a fantastic career. Uh, it, it's got to be strange for him because he's spent his entire college and pro career in the state of California, a Cal product, then landing with the San Diego Chargers. They moved to L.A. He's been a staple of those offenses with Phillip Rivers and Justin Herbert and just a, a terrific technician. And uh, when you're coming off the best season of your career at age 31, that's impressive. And now coming to a new team uh, in a northern climate, with uh, a lot of weapons and a young quarterback that he's worked with in the past with obviously Phillip Rivers and Justin Herbert. So it's going to be a rookie quarterback of some of some case, likely Caleb Williams. But what are your overall thoughts on, on Allen? You know, when I listened to him at the podium when he was introduced or with your interview, I, I like, first of all, a player that's concerned about the well-being of his body in the offseason because you don't set a path to the Hall of Fame, especially – getting up, you know, into your 30s and still being super productive if you don't put in the effort in the offseason. And for these guys that put the effort into the offseason, it tells me that it's important to them for what they do during the season. I love Keenan Allen's size. I like the fact that he still has the ability to use double moves to escape coverage, but it doesn't always have to be a huge window of opportunity because he knows how to use his body. He knows how to use his catching radius and he can take advantage of undersized defensive backs. And even when he was at the podium in his introduction news conference, he's saying, when you look at Cole Komet, when you look at DJ Moore, when you look at DeAndre Swift and you look at himself, it's hard for teams to commit to coverage. And if you can't commit to coverage against Keenan Allen and DJ Moore, you're going to open up big opportunities for either one of those guys or the tight end or possibly a back out of the backfield. So um, I think it's exciting, his attitude at this point, um, what how he wants his career to, you know, continue at that upward on that upward arrow and compliment the guys that he's going to play with. Uh, as you heard in the uh, interview as well, a big piano guy, and uh, maybe you and uh, he and John Scully can uh, – come up with a new Bears theme or something. The man plays Beethoven, for crying out loud. He's, he, he loves the piano. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, we talk about my brother-in-law, John Scully, who's also a trained concert pianist, and that's the one thing I envy him about him the most. He's had a super successful football career, but being able to sit down at the piano inside of his house and play songs off the top of his memory, and that's what I admire about Keenan Allen because – you have these guys that have that special characteristic that want to be good at something other than just the sport of choice. Again, it tells you a little bit about their intelligence and their commitments. Yeah, hard to believe a third-round pick, number 76 overall by the Chargers. Uh, really impressive, though, what he's done in his career. And so let's talk about some of it as it pertains to last season even. Again, 13 games, didn't play the full season, but y you talk about him and D.J. Moore. D.J. Moore... Averaged 15.1 a catch on first down on 35 catches last year. Keenan Allen, 11.1 on 47 catches on first down. Cole Komet, 10.4. The reason is, if you're getting first downs on first down, and you got three weapons right there, not including a DeAndre Swift who could take a swing pass and go 10 yards a catch as well, I mean, you are moving the sticks, and you're, you're keeping drives uh, in, in the much shorter category getting into the end zone. Correct? Well, yeah, well, it's funny because the other day when you did the interview with DeAndre Swift, you kind of asked him that same yeah. question. You almost average your first time every time you catch the ball. And now you think you get the compliment of, of Keenan Allen and then what DJ Moore is offering you and then how much it's going to open up for Cole Komet and Gerald Everett. So, I mean, there's a lot of explosive opportunity on this offense, and I'm excited to see it. And then, you know, one thing about Keenan Allen – you think back at his career, you go through a training camp developing Tyrod Taylor to come out and be your quarterback, and that's where you get all your reps. And all of a sudden, right before the first game, he has a mishap with one of the doctors, and they insert you know, Justin Herbert. So just that ability to on the fly make that adjustment and still have you know carrying on the same success you have. 
again, it tells you something about his ability to make adjustments in, in immediacy. All right, also third down, he's tremendous on third down, always has in his career. 210, I said it in the interview, 210 first downs on 261 career, third down catches. That's an 80% catch rate. Man, if you're if, if you're even cl- close to 70, that's, that's outstanding. Uh, but last season, DJ was number two in the league with 33 receptions on third down. He averaged 16.1 on third down catches. Five touchdowns. Allen, again, in 13 games, so it's a fewer numbers. 27 for 11.9 and three touchdowns on third down. And tied for third best in fourth quarter catches. And that's also when it's crunch time. That's where you got to make your hay. Uh, 20-plus yard catches. DJ, 25. Allen, 19. I mean, you know, just find completions. Whoever. (laughs) I mean, if it's going to be Caleb Williams... Find catches, man. Find completions. You know, at USC, obviously, we're, we're enthralled with what we see in the highlights of him scrambling all over, eyes downfield, and he's got great vision keeping those eyes downfield and, and under pressure, making completions, finding and scanning. I mean, boom, you hit your back foot, let it rip, especially on play action. If you're not going to one, go to two, and let's go. Well, exactly. Like I'm glad you said you brought up play action because, again, you start with the foundation of the Chicago Bears offense, and it's a running game that is up in the top five uh, uh, in all of the NFL. And then you add what you, the, the numbers you just read by each of these receivers. It's going to be an incredible opportunity for everybody, for the running back position to initiate the success, and then for the quarterback position to capitalize on a couple of receivers that they're not only good receivers, they're tough guys. And we've seen what DJ Moore has been able to bounce back from when he hasn't let, let let interrupt his concentration level. Keenan Allen has already demonstrated that throughout his career. So has Cole Komet. So when you're talking about a running game that's complemented by a tough group of receivers, I mean, the foundation is there for offensive success. Got to have protection, obviously. Got to protect yeah, that quarterback. Yeah. That's number one, especially as a rookie. You don't want him starting to see ghosts. That changes the whole complexion of things uh, for a quarterback. Some get past it, some don't. Uh, and then if you've got these two guys on each side, well, you know, Keenan's a slot receiver by trade, but they can line him up everywhere. Uh, what does this do for the tight end position, especially if they're in 12 personnel? If they have Gerald Everett and they have Cole Komet, uh, how open will the middle of the field be for the Chicago Bears if things are clicking? Well, first of all, you have two tight ends that are capable into accepting the responsibility of a one-on-one blocking assignment. So you have to take that into account when you're trying to uh, design the direct direction of protection. So now if you can you know, separate the protection enough or you can help an offensive tackle if he needs it, and then you has a hesitation route by the tight end, you still have to consider those guys a super effective option in the o in the passing game. But then you have a running backs so and what we we've seen what Roshan Johnson is able to do, what the what the what rest of these running backs can do in terms of their protection responsibility, because that's the first commitment that they have to make to the quarterback and the wide receivers. And with a good a couple good blocking tight ends, a couple good blocking running backs, it gives you that extra body and protection, and it can really be the saving grace to an offensive line if you feel there's some sep- some susceptibility to the rushing ability of your opponent. Steinhoffels is an employee-owned furniture and mattress store. Visit any of their four Chicagoland locations in Vernon Hills, Crystal Lake, Downers Grove, and Harwood Heights, or shop online at steinhoffels.com. Episode 60 of the Bears Etc. podcast rolling on. I want to say one thing about leverage. We talk about leverage when we're talking about a defensive tackle being low, lower than the offensive lineman can get their hands on them, and that creates an edge that they can penetrate and get through the gap. We talk about uh, leverage by a defensive back, uh, but we often don't talk about leverage created by a quarterback. And the leverage of getting the ball to a receiver where only he can get the football are always putting in a place where that that is shielding a defender. Um, Getting a quarterback like that and then a guy like Keenan Allen who's an expert at creating leverage – Having that chemistry, how long does that yin and yang come together for even a a young quarterback and a veteran wide receiver? Can the veteran receiver help the the vision of a quarterback and the trust of a quarterback to have that leverage 
lean in your direction, if you know what I'm yeah, trying to you say. Know, all right, so we, <clears throat> we've been doing the broadcast now almost 30 years, and then you, you remember the prevalency of the back shoulder throws. Yeah. Because that always hasn't been a target. You have to have a quarterback that has the confidence and the timing to get with his receivers that takes reps. And those are the kind of the reps that you really don't see on display during teamwork. Those are the reps that you see during one-on-ones or just a specific offensive period. So if you have a quarterback that has confidence in receivers that are competent to understand the timing of back shoulder throw, it's a significant weapon against uh, coverages, and that's the type of leverage you're talking about. In one of the highlights I liked out of Gerald Everett is Gerald Everett took a, a small little pattern out into the flat. He saw the quarterback get flushed, and then he worked up the sideline with leverage, as you're saying, and recognized that it was going to be a back shoulder throw and was able to make a completion for a touchdown. So this is not only a wide receiver thing. This is, like you said, the quarterback understanding leverage, the tight ends understanding leverage, and the receivers right now, they're making money because of it. Right. Accuracy is key, obviously, too, though. You know, got to give them a place where they can do something with the football when they don't have to slow down their route, uh, don't have to lean back. Sometimes you're going to have to, obviously, under pressure, but that'll be an important aspect of things as well. Uh, Also, when it's time to tackle some game day deals, then go with a grocer who's been a part of Chicago since 1899, Jewel Osco, the official grocery store of the Chicago Bears. All right, we got to talk Hall of Fame, Tommy. It's going to be an exciting summer for Bears fans, not only for the start of training camp, but Canton, Ohio, and ChicagoBears.com kicked off its five-part series last week on Steve McMichael and Devin Hester ahead of their induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, Outstanding senior writer Larry Mayer chronicles McMichael's decades-long friendship with his longtime teammate Dan Hampton. A quote from that article I know you're going to love. This is from Hamp. Quote, we were just big, gregarious, southern, hell-raising defensive linemen. It was just a fait accompli that we'd become running buddies. One from Arkansas, one from the heart of Texas. You had a first-hand view of it, Tommy. Getting your hand in the dirt every day at practice from 1985 until uh, 1990 when those guys... uh, ended that run of 10 seasons together. Remember, uh, we often forget uh, Hamp and McMichael and Fensick and other guys. Jay Hilgenberg started before you got there in 1991. We often think the 85 Bears, they just kind of started in 1984 with that loss in the playoffs. But no, it was 85 when they took off. But 1981 kind of started the whole ball rolling. And uh, wait, that was Jimbo Cover. You're also right, 81. Yeah. No, no. Or 83. Jimbo was 83. 83. Okay, 83. You know, one thing about those guys, so... Listen, I, I was a Bears fan, so I was well aware of every one of those guys that you just mentioned long before I became a part of the Bears. And then when I was drafted by the Bears, I became more aware of these guys. And then I happened to play with a couple guys in the USFL that gave me forewarning of Ming and Hamp and all these guys. But then I remember going to see the movie North Dallas 40. And I'm going, okay, it's it's my... <laughs> biggest goal in life to become a professional football player. And so then I went to see that movie, and obviously there's a little fabrication in that movie. But when I went to the Bears, it was it reminded me of North Dallas 40 because of Hamp and because of Ming and because of that crew of guys and the Mikey Hartensteins and the and the Fensix and you know in the entire offensive line of Horn and Hilge and Borch and stuff. So it offered you a lot of similarities to that movie. And there was as vivacious characters that were made up for a movie that I, I, I was in a real-life football scenario with them. All right, that was one of my favorite movies. It came out in 1979, so I was a junior in high school. And I had a buddy of mine, um, Tom Fry, who lived on my street in Mount Prospect, and I don't know how many times we saw that movie. And we, you know, they, they, they used to have, there were nicknames from the movie, and I can't remember. I think Poot was one of them. Uh, but, you know, you think about it. Nick Nolte was the, the, uh, the, the veteran yeah. receiver who just had taken oh, a receiver, beating. Right. Mac right. Davis was the quarterback. Yeah. Uh, and then Bo Svensson, he was Joe Bob on that, on that movie, and John Matuzak representing himself. <laughs> <laughs> so you're... <laughs> It's Hamp and McMichael. Right. You know, and Ming, Ming used to um, recite a lot of lines from that movie. And in the scenarios that they were using them in the movie, Ming was able to recite those lines. 
And yeah, and it was funny. And then the Nick Nolte line, every time you call it a business, uh, we call it a game. Every time we call it a game, you call it a business. Just some of those lines that have, have come out of it. But yeah, but you know, Jeff is um, the, the real life opportunity to experience and observe the real life North Dallas 40 because I came in and I was still a little shy and reserved. And like I said, I had the forewarning of McMichael and Hampton from a couple of guys I played with in the USFL and darn, if it wasn't true and coming in there and and being a part of those guys, I I just, I've had so much respect for them and I still do today. Well, you know, I know you've mentioned it before and maybe you can come up with something new for us. Because you tell a lot of stories, but maybe some uh, escape you. But if you had to explain what was it like every day going to practice, not only those grueling training camps, but the day-to-day grind against number 76, McMichael, and number 99, the Hall of Famer, Dan Hampton. Like, what sticks out to you? What sticks out to me, all right, so during training camp, a lot of times, so the practices were broken up in the run game in the morning and the pass game in the afternoon. So there was a little bit of an obvious to what you were going to try to accomplish and practice from the offensive side of it. So now I'm going against McMichael every morning, and he knows that we're going to predominantly run the ball. There's no chance. <laughs> There's no chance. Ming, Ming is <clears throat> strong, dedicated, a hardworking guy, and he's there every single day. But in the mornings, Hamp didn't do a lot. In the afternoons, Hamp would come out and he would have a full speed, full go practice, knowing that it's predominantly passing. And he's fresh. There, there was times that we couldn't get a pass off. Oh my! And I remember Ditka going one time. All right, we've had twelve attempted passes and we've been sacked twelve times. <laughs> we can't even get the ball off, and it's you know. With oh, these guys gosh. going full speed and them going live. And and that's what I'm saying. I, I remember going to an inner squad game in Platteville Stadium. And I gave up two sacks and I had two holding calls against McMichael. And Ditka was meeting the press after the practice was over and they were all gathered around him. And I was trying to sneak by out of his view. <laughs> and in the middle of this press conference, he goes, yeah, there, look at, there's fair. He gave up two sacks, had two <laughs> holding calls, and should have probably given up four. And so now I'm walking to our only day off for the oh. whole training camp, thinking from that second on until we come back to meetings the next night, even though we had a day off, that I'm I'm saying, okay, there's a chance I could be cut tomorrow morning, lose my job. And so you never Well, you and never the truth relax. about that is because you were new. I mean, you came from the USFL. They knew you. They scouted you. They loved you. They drafted you. But you are new onto the scene of this, this uh, basically a quilt of excellence on that team that really started in 84 and uh, the additions of yourself and several others that brought this all together. My goodness, you had to be a little nervous. Well, so it didn't. It not only pertain to me because no. I'm play. I'm playing next to a guy that should be in the Hall of Fame and is a record number of Pro Bowls and Jay Hilgenberg. So we're running that same inner squad game, and so we have this play. It's called Thirty Six G. Now I come down and I block the guy over the nose, and Jay pulls and he blocks Wilbur Marshall. <laughs> he goes and hits Wilbur Marshall and cracks his collarbone. In the inner squad game, and then plays the whole year with it. Wow! And then after the year's over, gets it operated on. So you talk mm. about a game. The inner squad game in Platteville, Jeff, was way more frightening than any of the regular season games that we played during the course of the season. I was there. That was the first time I covered sports in Chicago. The '85 Bears training camp. Yeah, wow, that's crazy stuff. See, these are the stories that I want to hear. These are great ones. Uh, The Road to Canton, make sure you check it out. The special bond between Dan Hampton and Steve McMichael. It remains strong. Great job by Larry Mayer. And every 23rd of the month, uh, ChicagoBears.com will release a feature on number 23, the one and only Mr. Ridiculous, Devin Hester. So it's exciting. I mean, so much excitement about the Bears, Tommy. I mean, we could talk about it all day long. Uh, Vizzy Hard Seltzer, flavors for every vibe. Celebrate responsibly. Molson Coors Beverage Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You got the 
the, the, the gift of the number one quarterback and the likelihood of, uh, of a rookie quarterback in Caleb Williams out of USC as they do their due diligence. Um, and a, a brand new fresh coat of paint on the offense and what's been added in free agency. You know, there's, there's impact uh, across the board. There's, uh, it's, you got to have a full roster, so you're you're getting some veteran backups on the offensive line. Ryan Bates, Matt Pryor, Jake Curhan, Coleman Shelton. There's going to be a competition at center. Dante Pettis is back. Swift and Allen, defensive side of the ball. Edge, Jake Martin, who's got familiarity uh, with uh, the coaching staff. Byron Cowart, uh, Amon Agbenagamiga. I don't know how I pulled it off. Don't know if it's accurate, but I get, made a good first run at it without even looking at the pronunciation guide on him uh, to help out on special teams. Jonathan Owens, Kevin Byard at safety, and it's going to create competition. There's still needs on this roster, but and then you got the Hall of Fame, and then you got the trip to London. I mean, it's going to be, there's a lot of excitement right now with the Chicago Bears, the stadium talk with President and CEO Kevin Warren, and what's going to happen there? Yeah, you know, the thing about it is we, we might have to go over this list with a fine-tooth comb yeah. and see how many obvious starters are, are in position right now. Because when you talk about all those names at the offensive line, Darnell Wright is a starter for me. Um, and I know there's, you know, you, you got Nate Davis and you have Tevin Jenkins, but I think there's going to be competition. And, you know, I think Braxton Jones will have competition. So it's – I like it more when there's a lot of uncertainty going to the OTAs and then they start that um, that season of impression. What do they do from the meeting rooms to the practice field? What do they do from the practice field to training camp? And so all those little details that will ultimately decide all of their jobs, it's – it's. I don't I, – I think you still have to be writing in – with pencil, most of those jobs. Uh, a nugget about the draft, and you can't assume anything because each uh, stair climb to rebuilding the roster and the vision that Ryan Poles uh, came here with, obviously a strip down. Then we add pieces, and now we're in year three, and this could be a very big, important takeoff year with a brand-new quarterback. And uh, But in, in his as he preps for his third draft, in the previous two, five of his seven picks in rounds one to three on defense, plus you throw in that trade of sweat. Uh, so it's been a somewhat defensive heavy. That side of the ball certainly is a stronger side of the ball until further notice. Obviously, now there's new additions, obviously, on the offensive side of the ball, uh, secondary being what it is as, as, as a strong point. Linebackers are set. So, uh, you know, that doesn't mean he's going to stick to that plan, but so far that's where his eyes have been. Yeah, uh, they have, but when you think of a, about a guy like Darnell Wright, you think, okay, if there's a guy there that is impressive to me where I can see a 10-year plan, yep. I'm not going to shy away from him. Like I said earlier at the very beginning of the show, I would like to see a team that's set on increasing the amount of sacks and quarterback pressures they have, especially within the division, to start taking a stronghold on the division to win the division and get in the playoffs. And um, However... But I think Ryan Poles and the due diligence he and his staff do investigating every one of these players, if there's a guy out there that just, <clears throat> excuse me, knocks them off their feet, it's going to be hard to ignore. So, you know, yeah, do I, would I love to see a, a defensive guy come in here, whether it's a guy that leaves with the reputation of Aaron Donald or comes in with the reputation of one of these double-digit sack rookie defensive ends, or... Is it that special offensive player that you almost feel like you can't live without? Mm -hmm. All right, we got to say uh, a few words about Justin Fields. First of all, uh, we wish him the best. Uh, he was a very classy guy with us at every turn, getting to know his family, getting to know Justin uh, with a, a load of pressure on him here in Chicago, obviously, and uh, make through changes, through multiple changes in the coaching staff, multiple coordinators, multiple plans, uh, and, you know, taking his lumps along the way, but also thrilling us with his dynamic athleticism, uh, not only as a runner because he had some really terrific uh, deep ball passing, as good as any in the league in terms of that accuracy, and uh, he's off to Pittsburgh now to compete with Russell Wilson and with one year left on, on his deal and a decision by the Steelers if they'll pick up his fifth-year option 
uh, in May. Uh, all that being said, uh, he, he was nothing but class here, and uh, the fans loved him, and he uh, appreciated them in return. I thought he had some classy comments on his Twitter goodbye to the fans, uh, the ex-goodbye as we, we call it now, but what are your thoughts on, on Justin moving on? You know, the next time Justin comes into Soldier Field or is any part of a Bear event, he's going to get a standing ovation. He's super well-respected, highly thought of in the locker room. He's never given any indication that he doesn't have less than a top-notch work ethic. I hope Justin plays over 51% of the time this year. Right. <laughs> so the Bears get that higher draft pick. Yep. Um, I, I have nothing bad to say about the young kid. I, I, I love every time I had a conversation with them. We both have French Bulldogs. That was always fun to compare and contrast. And I think he's got a tremendous upside. But you have to also understand the position the Bears are in because this doesn't come across very many times nope. in, a, in a franchise's history. And so I think Ryan Poles and the organization, Kevin and Matt Eberflus, made the decision – what's best for the organization, and we all wish the best for Justin. And I, I will never say a negative word about Justin Fields as, as long as I have a chance to talk about him or comment about him. Right. Uh, the, the man himself, uh, that, that's the hardest part about the trade, and uh, I think there's plenty in the building uh, of people and teammates that would agree. NFL owners meeting begins next Sunday in Orlando. I'll be headed down there on Sunday night. We'll have uh, conversations, hopefully, with Ryan Poles, and Matt Eberflus as they take a, a broad view of what has transpired up until uh, next month's draft. A uh, couple other nuggets, and we'll let you go, Tommy. Uh, are you buying any of the Justin Jefferson rumors that are cranking up out of Minnesota, or is it just because it's lying season in the NFL? The Vikings say they have no interest in trading him, uh, but they're they're looking for a quarterback. In fact, uh, Mel Kuyper and, or Daniel Jeremiah has Minnesota trying to move up now they have some draft capital with two first-rounders to go up at the number four spot to draft J.J. McCarthy uh, out of Michigan and a local product of Nazareth High School. So what, what do you think about that, and, and would that surprise you if they traded him? Well, if St Stephon Diggs can try to complain himself out of Buffalo when he's playing with a quarterback like Josh Allen, the receiver's best friend is an experienced quarterback. And a rookie quarterback – or a Sam Darnold doesn't give you the relationship that you develop with Kirk Cousins and you put up the numbers like Justin Jefferson has. So do I think there's nothing behind it? No, I think there is something behind it. Is it trying to position yourself to get the biggest contract in wide receiver history and then everything's going to be happy and roses after that? Or is, is he – finding that he needs a quarterback to develop that experience relationship with so he can have the best opportunities going forward. But, you know, like I said, if Stefan Diggs is trying to complain his way out of Buffalo, send Justin Jefferson to Buffalo <laughs> and then bring Stefan Diggs to Minnesota and you'll teach a couple of guys a really important lesson. All right, Tom, next week uh, we'll dig in, uh, amongst other things, of course. Uh, we're going to dig in with, uh, and, I, and I will do that before the, uh, oh, no, I guess I'll be doing this from the owners' meeting, actually. actually. So I'll have some insight there. Uh, but also we'll get into the division, their pluses and minuses, the ads and gains, and how it impacts the division. Of course, that's our number one focus, is winning the division. And uh, we'll be uh, interested to talk about that. Again, thanks to Miller Lite, our presenting sponsor here. Tastes like Miller time. Go to MillerLite.com slash Bears Pod to find delivery options near you. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. For Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please subscribe now on the Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Hey, wherever you get your podcasts. Can you give me a bear down? And bear down. Yeah, that one with meaning. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Talk to you later.